Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much. Okay, how is everyone? How are you? All good? Yeah, I hope you're all good. And I hope you have scanned your, the QR code that we have outside. That's really important for us. And I also hope that you are aware of our series. What's the name of our series? What's our series title? Be Rooted, right? And I'm reminded that I'm rooted whenever people actually put their hands on their forehead when they greet me. I'm rooted because I'm old, you know, like an old tree has so many roots. Yeah? But Be Rooted, on the other hand, is actually a way for us, in this sense, a way for us to know our God more. See, when, when we say we are rooted, it's knowing who saved us. It's knowing the God we worship. It's knowing the God who provides for us. It's knowing the God and His attributes, His character, His commands, His promises, His heart, first and foremost. And I've seen this quote while having lunch today. So we had a good lunch. And let me see if you can guess where this came from. With just a drop of imagination, the world can transform into magical places where adventures begin and anything is possible. Yeah? If you want to know, come with me. Um, well, you pay for the lunch and I'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> okay, so, well, actually I've said that because I want you to imagine right now. Right? And with this also, I want you to guess what is the name of God that we will be discussing today. Well, just, let's just imagine for a moment that the sun and moon would go away. What do you think would happen? Right? The sun is orbiting around the sun. Oh, the earth is orbiting around the sun. And if the sun goes away, what would happen? The earth would lose its orbit. It would go in a straight trajectory and going to nowhere. But lo, maybe there would be no time for you to think because by the time that happens, we would also all be frozen to death. Right? And how about the moon? What if it disappears? No more low tide and high tide. Yeah? Happy days? I don't think so. There are species actually depending on the high and low of the water. And they will die. And of course, I think it would also affect us emotionally as people, humans who actually are curious about what's happening around us. And I would like to show you a couple of numbers here that maybe for some of us doesn't make sense. And I would like to warn you that when I gave this message earlier in the morning, that they had the nosebleed because they couldn't understand the numbers. And I hope we would, I would try to explain as much as possible. I'm not saying I, I'm an expert. This is just an example for us to actually uh, appreciate how God provides. And I wonder how we would go. See the numbers in front. This is actually a series called Fibonacci series, which are a series which is created or derived by adding the two previous numbers to get the next one, right? So one plus one, you get, and one plus two, and we go, go on like that, right? Now, why is this important? Why is this something that I'm showing you? Because these numbers actually shows many of the flowers following this pattern. See? One, two, three. It doesn't show there, but it's actually five, uh, eight, thirteen, right? Most of the daisies, all, all of them, actually follow the Fibonacci series. Isn't that interesting? How can flowers count? How do they even know that series exists? But look at this. It's viral. A pine cone. If you like, count the number of spirals going clockwise, you'll have 13. 13 is a part of the Fibonacci series. But what's more? You go the other way around, you have 8, which is also part of that series. These numbers appear also for the sunflower. You go counterclockwise, you have 34, which is still part of that series. And the other way, 21. Still again, part of the series. Fibonacci just discovered this. He didn't invent it. This is happening all around nature. And that's something that people don't appreciate. God provides things which we don't see and things that we actually have which we don't even appreciate. The air you breathe, are you appreciating that? The hot air we have, the humid humidity we have. 
Don't you know that that benefits you? Everything that's happening in the world, if you really look deep, you would appreciate who God is and what He provides. This one as well. If you actually arrange the Fibonacci series in squares and try to progressively arrange them this way, it would have that pattern, what they call now, and they discovered to be the golden ratio. What is interesting about this golden ratio? Well, most of the seashells actually form that. It follows that pattern. How about this? The rose follows the Fibonacci series, which also has the golden ratio in it. How about these? Hurricanes and some galaxies follow that pattern. And this is most amazing. Many body parts actually follow the Fibonacci series. Yeah? From the ear, not only on the side, also in the front, also our hands, ratios for fingers versus arms, versus thumbs, versus the palm, actually follows the Fibonacci series. How amazing is that? God is amazing. You see? What's good about this, I'm showing you these things because I would like you to appreciate how God provides. Right? Some of us, we think like God provides only physically, only materially. But He also provides our intellectual needs. He actually gives us and tries to just spur our curiosity. The way, the hunger to explore, the hunger to learn, right? Our quest for knowledge. He gives us all those. Most of all, He actually drives our passion because of the things that He provides. It stirs something within us to, for us to do something greater, we think. Well, He also provides our spiritual needs. Now, do you now know, given all these clues, do you know what name we are going to discuss today? Oh, I didn't talk to you. <laughs> but that's good. We are discussing today, God our provider, Yahweh Yira. Can you say that to your neighbor? Yahweh Yira. He is our provider. Do you know how he provides? Right? Look at this verse in Luke chapter 2. And so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring to you good news. That's how God provides. He gives you good news. Not only that, of great joy. Not only that, for all the people. See how God provides? He doesn't provide for one. And yes, He provides for you specifically. But when He provides, He's thinking about all the people. Of great joy and good news. For today in the city of David, there has been born of you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Why is this significant? Well, you will not appreciate this if you do not know the bad news. What is the bad news? Well, the bad news is simply put Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is the bad news. And if you know the bad news, you would appreciate what Luke is saying. And it actually is, well, detailed more in Isaiah 53. Look at this. All of us like sheep have gone astray. What does that mean? That means we have rebelled against God. We have sinned against Him. Why? Because we are actually opting to follow our own self. Self-will, that's the problem. Self-will. We worship ourselves instead of the God who created us. Each of us turn on his own way, isn't it? self, our own, me. It's the meist theology. <laughs> meism. Always me. Meism is our problem. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on Him. Isn't that great? Oh yes, we have fallen. Oh yes, we have made a mistake. And we are sure to be our destiny is sure to be in that eternal lake of damnation. But praise God, because He knew beforehand what our problem is and therefore provided the greatest solution to our problem. Because our greatest problem is what? 
sin. Our greatest problem is rebellion, our self-will. But Jesus is the greatest provision for us. And He is the greatest solution to our problem. Praise God. He's really a good God. He knows in advance. And you know what, what Yahweh here means? Yahweh. When we say Yahweh, it's the personal name of God. Right? It actually is found in this verse which I'm going to show you. Genesis 22, 14. It's first mentioned in this verse. And by reading it, probably you know the context of where it happened. And Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide Yahweh Yiram. As it is said this day on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Yahweh, the name of God which is personal. His personal name. A name which means eternal existing one. One who desires relationship with you and me. Who are we to have that relationship with the God so great? Think about it. Who are we? And yet, He desires a relationship with you. He is also the promise keeper. He is the covenant keeping God. That even if you fail, even if people forget, even if your mother or father or your mother most specially forgets you, He doesn't. Because He has inscribed you in His hand. In the book of Isaiah, it says that. He has inscribed you in His hand. He knows you deeply, personally. Not only knows you by head, he knows your deepest needs. He knows your deepest longings. He knows beforehand, before you even ask of it. And there are many things that we actually need, we think we need, and He doesn't provide because He knows that it would destroy us. That is what it means, Yira, Yahweh Yira, God provides. But the English version is also foundational. When you say provide, it comes from two root words. Pro, which means before, and video, which is to see from far away. Provide, providere. Latin is videre, which is to see from afar. Provision there is something that really gives beforehand. Because he sees beforehand, he's ahead of you, he knows what you need, he knows what would really make you a better person, he knows what would develop you. And that's why He provides. That's why when you see or hear the word provide, God is our great provider, it's more than your material or physical need. It's everything of who you are and what you need. Can you see now how enormous that word is? When we are, you know, what's bad about us, right, human beings, when we say God we will provide, we're talking about a house, a car, something to drink, something to eat. But that is really underestimating who God is. You and me have often misunderstood our God. He's underappreciated and many times we actually reject His provisions. Well, to be obvious, right? Many people reject Jesus, the greatest provision for our greatest problem. But not only that, right? Why do we actually think and reject and underappreciate what God provides? Because we have our own selfish expectations. That's one. Our thinking is only to ourselves. We are not depending on what God actually wants for us to do or to have. We also have a worldly view. Very worldly. And therefore, we cannot really what, see what God wants us to have or to be. We are being driven by self. And therefore, this is the antidote that God gives us. In Matthew 6, he specifically says, Do not worry then, saying what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So He knows beforehand. And, and because He knows, He provides accordingly. He knows, He sees that you need it, and therefore He gives it. And, and He also see instead of that, here is what you should think. 
but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, for all these things will be added to you. There was a time when I had all my grass like uh, our lawn. The grass grew so high, just because sometimes I'm lazy. So it grew so high that after a couple of months, me and my, my elder son decided to cut it off, right? To, to cut it with our old lawnmower. My, my first lawnmower was stolen and that's why it grew high. And then we bought the second hand one. Now, with bravery, we tried to cut the grasses. And it was just so horrendous. But you know what happened? After a couple of minutes, our neighbors actually came, visited us and said, do you, ha do you need any tools? We have perfect tools for you so you can cut this easily. So they gave us a backhoe, well actually not gave us, but let us borrow their backhoe, their fork, some of the, I, uh, I think they forgot what it's called, the sickle, the small one, for us to cut our lawn, our backyard. And of course, I didn't ask for that, but God knew beforehand that we needed that for us to finish it quickly. See, God provides in strange ways. I didn't ask my neighbor and call them to actually give me those tools, no, they just came. My, and I don't know, I, I hope this would not offend anybody, right? Our neighbor is a Kiwi. The other neighbor is a Sri Lankan. And yet they came offering these things. Why? God somehow touched their hearts to help me and my son in our deepest needs because of our laziness. Yeah? God is good. God is good. All the time, yes. And should not this give you comfort that God knows your deepest needs and that He will provide your needs? That should give you tremendous comfort, right? Are you thinking about that? Are you thinking about and thankful about many things that God provides you? I hope that you are. I hope that every day when you wake up and before you sleep, that you always thank God of what happened that day and what would God do tomorrow. Because for sure, God will give you another day of provision. God provides what we truly need. He knows your needs. Sometimes we do not know our needs. He provides, He sees before, and He knows and He will provide. Sometimes we ask for things that is harmful for us. We think that we need it, but you know, it becomes harmful. For example, our kids. Sometimes what is the favorite thing they ask from us? They want sweets, right? They want candy. In Kiwi, they want lollies. I can still understand up to now what's the difference between candy and lolly. Seems like they're one. Maybe it's something for me to learn, right? Even good things that we uh, think that good things we think are good actually can become bad. So let's be careful of what we ask. But then again, God who knows what you need would not give you the thing that would destroy you. I, ex I experienced God provision when I was still back in the Philippines and still single. Um, I knew why my wife then, but we were not yet married. So she was my wife to be. And before that, I had, I somehow, one time when I visited her, I was bitten by a mosquito. Why did I know that? Well, because I was actually hit with dengue. I didn't know that I had dengue. So I was living alone in my own boarding house. Nobody with me. And I was just sleeping, but I felt that my body was weakening. I didn't know why I was weakening. But then I thought I would just sleep and let's see what happens, right? I was just sleeping there, and I didn't realize that I couldn't stand up anymore. Until, I, did, I couldn't stand up anymore. I realized that when suddenly, out of the blue, my brother called. This brother of mine doesn't call me frequently, but for some reason, he called me that night and was just there to call me to see how I'm doing. And I said, I'm feeling weak. I think I cannot stand up anymore, but I hope I would recover the next day. Well, he hung up the phone and actually came by to rescue me. I didn't know why I thought I would recover. I always had that mindset that 
any kind of sickness that would hit me, I'll be able to recover from it. That's my pride anyway. But you know what? I wasn't really able to stand up. I realized that because when my brother came, right, he had to actually <laughs> carry me from the bed. I couldn't stand at all. That means my platelet count had already gone down so far that it, I'm about to die. Well, of course, I wasn't afraid. Dying is... I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm not afraid to die, but because I know I'm saved, right? But, but for me, what I was thinking, right, but if I die today, I die. That's it. <laughs> kind of crazy. Maybe I am. But <laughs> so he brought me to the hospital. You know what, what happened in the hospital? I was brought in the hospital. I didn't have anything to pay. Back in the Philippines, that's impossible because the company had just had, had me covered. What is another thing? I also needed blood because I need blood transfusion because so many platelets have gone out. I need to have that infused. And many friends actually came and donated. Did I ask for that? God knew beforehand. God knew beforehand that I had nothing to pay for my hospitalization. Right? Especially in the here, you don't we don't appreciate that because everything's for free. You're about to die, the government government provides for us. But we don't even appreciate that. Don't you know that that's God's provision as well? Oh yes, this country actually provides for you. But in essence, it's God who provides them. It's God who gives you those. And are we not appreciating that? Sometimes we just lure it away, right? Just forget about it. Oh, the government would pay for it. They owe me because I pay my taxes. Oh, really? You may be owing God more. Yeah? God provides and it should be our comfort. Tremendous comfort. Not only that, also provides our finances. Materially, physically, intellectually. And how about all the encouragement I got? Isn't that a provision too? How about the friends that visited? When, when you are sick, people who are coming to you are God's provision to actually refresh you. To encourage you, to inspire you. To tell you, keep on going because we've got you covered. We'll pray for you. In the end, God got you covered. God will provide. God will provide what we truly need, His way, His time, for our eventual good. To accomplish His purpose and in and through us. So that's how it provides. He provides His way, His time, and for His purposes. Yeah? Can you say that to your neighbor? God will provide... Praise God. <laughs> what a law. I just wanted you to say, God will provide His way, His time, for His, for His purpose. Right? His way, His time, and His purpose. But one thing that maybe you don't want God to provide is this. Testing. Who wants tests? Who wants to be tested every day? If you want tests, maybe there's something wrong with you or there's maybe something wrong with me. Because for me, I don't like tests. But you know, test is actually good for you. I remember my, my father, right? My father one day, he was able to buy a piece of land back in the Philippines. And it was in an inclined slope. This is in Baguio. So he decided to cut on cost. So he didn't hire any engineer. He thought, ah, I know what to do. I know how to calculate how the post would, dimensions would be. I know how high they would be and what materials to use. And he handed this to a laborer who's also not a graduate. And there was no test. They just built it up and it stood up. And they were, a couple of people were actually able to stand on the house when it was finished. Just before we were about to transfer to the house, an earthquake came. This is a Baguio earthquake. If you remember that, anybody remember that Baguio earthquake? If you remember, then you're as old as me. Yeah, if you don't, you were not born yet. Yeah, and when this earthquake came, there was total collapse. There was nothing left. It just, it was just like a domino that fell over. Nothing left. 
And praise God, we were not there. Otherwise, our whole family would be in the grave. And I praise God for that because lately, they knew about Jesus and they saved him. If they died then, they would not have that chance. Praise God. God is good. He is really able to see beforehand. You see tests. Let's go back to the test, right? Because I think you're forgetting. We are in the topic of tests. And we don't like tests. And we have to test. If my father only maybe got the proper contractors and engineers and did the proper test, it would not have fallen that way. Because they would have put the proper structure in place. Also, in software, for those of you who work on software, isn't it that we do many tests? Yeah? Unit tests. What, what kind of tests do we do? Integration tests, automated, regression, smoke tests, every test that you can think about, we do. Why? Because once a bug goes outside the shop floor, it's actually 20 times more cost to pay if you cost it at that point in time. Understand why test is so important. Not only that, in software, do you know, if we don't test the software properly, it would kill people. There are now many software that are used to actually allocate medicine to different patients in an hospital. They are now labeled, well, put in, put in by robots, you know, hand robots put, uh, with proper labels on them. And if this software actually wrong, is wrong, gives it to the wrong patient, what would happen? You can imagine what would happen. Many bad things could happen. And it would cost your head, literally. Right? That's why this is what God is telling us. Look at James 1, 2, 4. Consider all joy, my brethren, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Yeah? What is that? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Testing here comes from the Greek word Erasmus, which is to tell me, tell me what's inside me, to test me. And what is saying? What is James saying? Consider it all joy. It says basically here that you should change your mind when test comes, when trials comes. Our mind should be, we should be joyful. And you think that is crazy. No, it's not crazy. Because it is mentioned here in the Bible, you should change your perspective. Consider it all joy because if you are not tested, you will not know what you are made of. And when the storm comes, you will be just blown away and don't know what hit you. Right? Therefore, you should welcome test when it comes. Because it would reveal, not to God, to you, who you really are. And if you really have true faith. If you really have strong will. If you really have that ability to trust in the God whom you worship. And maybe it would reveal to you who you really worship. So test is very good. And it specifically tells here in this verse that it produces what? Endurance. It will make you stronger. It will not weaken you. It builds you up. It makes you grow. It makes you more sturdy. And here's what endurance does. If you have endurance, let it be. Have, let's have, have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete. So it makes you a better person, lacking in nothing. So what should be our mindset? We should consider it all joy. Yes, you should be joyful. When testing happens, when you see, when testing comes, God means to build you up. The devil, he would mean to destroy you. But ultimately, if God gives the test, and when you are under test, surely God would build you up. He would make sure that you would grow. Because he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He will do that. He mentioned it in his word. He will do it. He will fulfill it at its proper time. Are you growing in your testing today? Are you going through some sort of testing, some sort of trial or hardship? Have you lost your job? Maybe lost a loved one? Maybe is worried that COVID would hit, hit you someday? Maybe you're just going through emotional turmoil at the moment, depressed, don't know what to do, confused. Well, you know what? 
that testing, you should say, Lord, thank you for this testing. Now I know that even in this testing, I could trust you. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why I could not understand or maybe fathom what's happening to me at the moment. This is what I know, that you are a faithful God and you will deliver me from this. He would deliver you from this. Maybe not in this life, but in the next life. Yeah? Do you believe that? You should believe that. Because that's what the Bible says. He's a good God. He's a God who will carry you through. That is, if you are His child. Once you understand God's heart, your attitude will change. Once you understand who God is, and what he's doing in your life, you would say, Lord, thank you so much. Because now I know that I'm actually weak. Now I know that I'm actually not trusting you. Now I know that I should change my mind. Lord, I will cling to you more. Isn't that good? Well, look at, let's look at a person who actually encountered this test. We started with Yahweh Yira, right? And it comes from the chapter Chapter 22 of Genesis. Well, in this same chapter, actually Abraham was tested in many ways. He was tested in the area of love, in the area of obedience, and in the area of faith. But let's look at first in the area of love. So, let's, let's before we go there, I just would like to remind you that God does not only provide physical needs, but also spiritual needs, which is more important. And it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. Who initiated the test? Was it Abraham? No, right? Very clearly, it says here, God tested Abraham. God initiated the test. Yeah, it is God who initiates the test. Not only that, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love. This is the first time that love was, is mentioned in the Bible. The very first time that this word love is mentioned. And it describes a love between a father and a son. The way Abraham loved Isaac. Why is that significant? Well, let's continue. So, the son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Now, why is it that why, uh, that is important? The mention of love in the first place. You know why? Isaac, who is Isaac? He is the son of promise, isn't it? Well, Isaac actually is the picture of and hope of Abraham because he dreamt of it. He waited for Isaac. How, how many long years? Well, you know, how long he waited? When he was 75, he was given this promise. Sarah at that time was 65, 10 years younger. Yeah? So Abraham was 75 and what did they say? Sarah specifically said, we have passed the age of giving birth. And therefore, she laughed. Right? And finally, Isaac is here, so Abraham was loving him, enjoying because he was the child of promise, and suddenly, God would ask that he would be offered as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which God would tell him. So for Abraham, this is really very hard, right? How would you feel? 25 years, oh, <coughs> years of waiting and suddenly God would tell you, go and sacrifice him. He's a miracle son. He's the son of promise. Why this? You would say. But let's go back to, what, to that later on. I would like us to focus on Mount Moriah. You know Mount Moriah? What is the significance of this mountain? What do you think? Well, this is the same mountain would actually where Jerusalem would sit in the future. This is the significance of that mountain. Mount Moriah is a mountain ridge. 
and in one of these mountains, Jerusalem would sit. And this is where God actually asked Abraham to kill Isaac. You see, Isaac, God was not asking Abraham to bring Isaac to the mountain to dedicate him. No, he doesn't say that. It says specifically here, go and offer him there as a burnt offering. What, what is God doing here? You would ask. Now, before you judge God, and I hope we won't judge God. We cannot, right? He's sovereign. But before we judge God, remember in the book of Deuteronomy, God is against child sacrifice. He actually commanded the Israelites not to do it. Even if you visit the book of Leviticus, God condemns child sacrifice. So how would you reconcile the two? Well, it's a bit hard to reconcile the two. But before you jump to conclusions, listen till the end so that you would not miss out. Well, there was uh, this, these two couples, right? They were waiting for a child. They wanted badly to have a child. So they did many things, they prayed about it, they met many doctors, gone into many procedures, yet nothing. But after many, many years, especially the wife, when, when they, they tried so many things, they finally had one child, and it's a baby girl. And one thing that the wife didn't know was, was something was happening to her. Right? She became overprotective, overly controlling. And by the time that the girl actually grew up to be a teenager, what do you think would have happened? Yes, exactly. The teenager was rebellious. And she felt smothered. In Tagalog, is smothered, right? Is smothered. In Tagalog, it's uh, nasasakal. Like uh, you're, in English, constricted. Is that correct? Con yeah, the, the word Tagalog is very good. Nasasakal. English. <laughs> I don't know the in English equivalent, sorry. But you know, some something good can become something bad when we focus all our hearts and attentions to that something. In this case, the baby girl. You see... Sometimes, what God gives becomes an idol to us. For this couple, especially for the wife, the baby girl became an idol to her. So why did God ask Abraham this? To sacrifice Isaac? It was actually to protect Abraham. To test Abraham and let Abraham know what is inside his heart. Because anything that is more than God becomes an idol. Anything that takes the place of God becomes an idol. Especially, especially the idols of the heart. Look at this verse in Ezekiel. Son of man, see these men have set up their idols in their hearts. And have put in front of their faces the stumbling block of their wrongdoing. See, you have an idol. Finally, what would it do to you? It would be a stumbling block. It would not only kill you, it's ultimately to destroy you. It's to make you a nobody. To make you a worthless being. That's what an idol does to you. And in the end, what does God describe this? These are abominations. Yeah, one abomination. You know, one child can come to our church and ask us, right? Or maybe somebody who knows you as a Christian, if you actually don't behave properly, and if you have an idol in your heart, would ask you, so you go to church every Sunday, can I know what kind of abomination your church is? Instead of saying what kind of denomination you attend to. Yeah? 
What if they ask you that? Maybe there's something wrong with our hearts because they can see abominations instead of a denomination. See, it's quite dangerous for us to have idols of the heart. And therefore, let's be careful because idols can be anything. Yeah? It can be a relationship that God does not like. It could be a family, a child, or maybe even your ministry. That can become an idol. Well, anything that takes place, the word of God's God's place, would become an idol. And sooner or later, it would destroy you. If it's a person that you're idolizing or worshipping, right, without you knowing it, sooner or later, guaranteed, 100%, and no doubt about it, that that person would disappoint you. It's only a matter of time. So be careful. But, in this case, God is protecting Abraham. God sees in advance. He is Yahweh Hira. He can see. And He is protecting Abraham by testing him. So how do you know that you have idols? Well, what is something that you love the most? What's the, the, the thing that actually keeps you awake at night? What is in your mind that if you don't have it, it would make you unhappy? Something that you would might be thinking that unless God gives me this, I would not be happy at all. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an idol. Emotions. Right? Things that actually make you angry. Things that you're, you know, bursting about when you don't have it or taken from you. These are idols. So if you are fighting for something and you think that that's your life, when it goes away, you will not any longer live, that's an idol. What does the Bible say? God love, with, love God with all your hearts. So God protects you by testing you to examine your own self. Know thyself. That's the test of love for Abraham. And yet, what did happen? Well, let's see. I know that you know what happened, but let's see. Maybe it would change. Test of obedience. This is the second thing that we learned, right? Abraham was also tested in terms of obedience. But look at how Abraham responded. In Genesis 22.3, it says specifically here, So Abraham got up early in the morning. Wow! You are actually commanded to go and kill your child, and he went up early in the morning. Isn't that interesting? But look how obedient he is. He's obedient not because he heard the command. He's obedient because he knows the person who's giving the command. He knows him. And he knows him intimately. And he knows that even with the bad thing, he can turn it around. That's how great Abraham knows who God is. Do you know your God? Do you kneel down every day to worship him? Or just kneel down every day because you need something. Well, maybe it's time for you to really think about how your relationship with God is. Is it only a business relationship thing? I heard that before. My relationship with my wife, somebody I heard, is like a business thing. And that's why he had other affairs. And this is a Christian person. So sad. Not only that, I'm so sad when I read that, but you know, that's another story for some something later. Well, he woke up early, right? But not only that, he also saddled his donkey, took two of his young men and his son Isaac and split wood for burnt offering. So what did he do? Not only did he wake up, he did everything that was necessary for the sacrifice. Everything. He was obedient. Now children, may I ask you, what is the turnaround time when your parents actually ask you to do some chore? 
when they ask you to wash the dishes, how long would it take for you to actually respond? Eh? <laughs> Five minutes, one minute, two minutes. Delayed obedience is what? Yes, we know that. We learned that in Sunday in our next gen. Right? We learned that. Yeah, Corinne, yeah. We learned that. Are we applying it in our lives? Are we obeying our parents? Well, of course, if it's not before, uh, well, according to God's, God's word in the Bible, we don't, right? But if there's nothing wrong with the commands or the requests coming from your parents, are you obeying them quickly? Or are you delaying, trying to annoy them and see how they would respond? Are you testing your parents? Or are they testing you? Well, don't test your parents, please. Obey. See? Look at Abraham, how he actually obeyed. Don't let them wait. You obey, especially in, when it comes to chores. Because in the end, it would profit you, not them. Yeah? You don't believe me? Do it and see what happens. It would make your house a lot cleaner. And would you be... Would, you would be happy in a house living in, living in a tidy place, right? So who benefited? Everyone. And for a small thing that you did. Praise God. Because we can actually do our part and bless many people if we do. You know, there was this uh, story. So Pastor Peter actually visited a big group assembly in the South, South Philippines, right? And it so happened that a typhoon came before, before he actually visited them. And there was this bis businessman who was selling some commodities. That was his business. He was selling commodities. And he was so eager to actually ask Pastor Peter this. What happens if you obey God? And he said, I obeyed God. And I would like to tell you my story. So God impressed in my heart that I would not increase the prices of my commodities that I'm selling even with the typhoon that, came pla uh, that took place. Right? So, yes, many people thank him and they were very happy. But then after some time, the government actually bought and imported the commodities that he was selling as well. Only problem is that when the government did that, they were much more in a lower price. And therefore, people actually started to buy those instead of his one and he was going bankrupt because he is losing money. Right? Nobody was saying anything. The, the stock were just sitting there as an inventory and people were ignoring what he was selling. And he asked, is this how God actually repays you after you've obeyed him? Well, it's hard to answer such a question, right? But you know what happened? Another typhoon came, Typhoon Ulysses, which actually destroyed and had the commodities that the government bought to become wet. And when they became wet, they are no longer usable and sellable, and therefore the prices of those commodities jacked up so high that they started, well, many people started to buy commodities again from the guy. Praise God for that, because he was able to recover. And you see, he obeyed God, and in the end, it turned out to be for his own good. He recovered his business. He start, it started to pick it up again. Yeah. So God would really provide in his proper time. So obedience would really bring, bring blessing if you just wait for God to do his move. Yeah, praise God. There is also this test of faith. So on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. So he saw Mount Moriah. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there, and we, look at that pronoun, we, will worship and return to you. Who is Abraham referring to when he said we? There are only two of them, right? Abraham and... Wait a minute. I thought Abraham and Isaac are going up to the mountain so Isaac would be offered. Offered means a burnt offering and therefore Isaac would die, right? But why is Abraham saying here, we will worship and return to you? 
Isn't this a statement of faith? That God knows, Abraham knows that he is going to sacrifice his son. And yet, saying to those two young men who accompanied them, we will come back to you and worship with you together. We, not I. It's a declaration and a statement of faith. One more thing. He did not say, we will come and sacrifice. No, he said, we will worship. Abraham was going there to worship and coming back to worship. You see the difference? He did not, his mindset is not to sacrifice. His mindset is to worship God. Worship, active, what should be driving you. Why? Because he is Yahweh, Yira. He would provide. Well, you cannot still reconcile, right? When you cannot reconcile, this is what you cannot reconcile, right? I cannot reconcile this as well. Why would a good God ask for my son that I love be sacrificed? That's unreconcilable. Why? Because God is a God of love, and yet here he is asking me, asking Abraham to actually sacrifice his son. But because God, Abraham knew God that deep, he was willing to do it. You see, that is where faith comes in. You do not understand the circumstance. You, but you know God's promises. You know His commands. You know Him intimately and therefore, I follow God anyway. It's not the circumstance that would dictate what I would do. The circumstance is nothing. It may, it may be killing me, but God, He is here. He is Yahweh. The one I know. The one who knows me. The one who knows my needs in advance. He's Ahead of me, he knows and he will provide. That is faith. When you cannot reconcile what's happening to who God is, faith would actually be needed for you to carry on. So keep on doing what you're doing. What God wants you to do, even if it's hard, even if it's questionable, because you do not know what's in the future, what's before us, until sometime that God would reveal it to you. See, you resolve it by doing what God tells you to do anyway. And you just have to make sure that you're rooted in God's word so that you will be clear and really know that what you're doing is for Him. You have to do and you have to know Him deeply. You have to that, have that intimate relationship with Him for you to go about it. So how did Abraham do it? You see, his faith if is progressive. It did just it did not happen on that day only. Well, it happened this way. Look, it is actually explained in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Let's go back in time, but in, up to the New Testament, right? In Hebrews eleven eight, he said he it says here by faith Abraham when he was called obeyed God by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he left, not knowing where he was going. Can you do that? You don't know where you're going, but you heard God to say that go, and you went. Look at what kind of faith he has. By faith, when he was called, he obeyed by going out to the place which he was to receive for an inheritance. What was that place? I don't know, he said. Right? And he left, and he just obeyed. When he had a problem with his nephew Lot, what happened? So he let Lot choose. For me, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. In his mind, Abraham was saying, I know that God would put me in a place better than what I, what I think. See, he does not choose for himself. He lets God actually choose for him. Because he knows God knows better. When there was a problem in Sodom and Gomorrah, who did Abraham trust? When Abraham rescued his nephew Lot. Remember that time? Who did he trust? When there was a problem with Hagar and Ishmael. Who did Abraham trust? When Isaac was promised to Abraham. Who did he trust? See? Progressively, his faith became stronger and stronger. 
the more he encountered God, the more he knew about who God is, and the more the intimacy actually grew. Are you growing that intimacy with him? Is your faith growing? Are you doing what he's commanding you to do? By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, this again, offered up Isaac, Isaac, and the one who had received the promises. So this now is the time that he offered Isaac. Let's see what Abraham was thinking. It was he to whom it was said, through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. So he knew that promise, right? But this is what he was thinking. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. You see, when Abraham actually received the promise that he was going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, he was in his mind, in Abraham's mind, he already thought that Isaac is dead. But even if he dies, God can raise him up from the dead. You see his mindset? That's why he was there, ready to do what God asked him to do. What a wonderful kind of faith. In it grew not only in that instant, but with the series of events that happened in his life. So, whatever you are in right now, make use of that to let God grow you. To let God grow your faith. To let that test glorify him in the end. Because it will. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took it in his hand, took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. So can you imagine what's happening here? So they were walking now. And Abraham actually laid what? The burnt, the wood for the burnt offering. Who's the burnt offering? Isaac, right? How much or how many wood? How do I quantify this? How much wood would it take for the burnt offering to be burnt? A few? A lot, right? And when say a lot, it's a lot. What that means is when Abraham put this on Isaac's shoulders, he laid him on his back, it should have been very heavy. What that means is that Isaac is no longer a child. In actual fact, at this point in time, scholars say he's about 17 years old. 17 years old, probably already grown up. No, not probably, he's grown up. Right? And it could have been, well, it could have been some, 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 something would have been happening in Isaac's mind. But if that's what we knew. He was able to carry that amount of food. And here comes the awkward moment. And Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood. Oh, that's the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Well, if you were Abraham, how would you answer? Yeah? You are the sacrifice. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Abraham said, you see what Abraham said? God will provide for himself. Elohim, hear a law in their language. Yahweh, hear a law. Yahweh, hear a he will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. What an answer. It's so profound. So the two of them walked on together. You think Abraham was tricking Isaac just to comfort Isaac? I don't think so. Why? Well, when they came to the place, Mount Moriah, of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there, and arranged the wood. So he arranged the wood. So there's an altar first, right? There's an altar. And he arranged the wood. And bound his son Isaac. And laid him on the altar. On top of the wood. See the picture? So here's a grown up boy. Now on top of the altar with the wood underneath him. 
and the stone underneath that. Yeah? Getting that picture? And Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to, the, to slaughter his son. He was really determined to do so. Like this picture. Is there a picture there? No? <laughs> yeah. So the picture was, we have the stone, which is the altar they're calling, wood, and on top of that would be his son. I don't know how they've done that, but that's how it would be positioned. Otherwise, you would not burn the burnt offering efficiently, right? So Abraham reached his hand. Question for you. Or maybe the question we need to ask is, why did Isaac not run? He was fully capable. He's a grown-up. He's probably stronger than Abraham. You know why? So what year was Abraham when Isaac was born? Abraham was 100 years old, isn't it? When Abraham was born. If Isaac was 17 years old at this point, then Abraham would have been 117 years old. Can you imagine the difference in strength between the two? Isaac could have simply killed Abraham at that point. As then he would call it self-defense. But Isaac did not run or fight or do anything bad to his father. Why do you think that is? You know what? I would actually go on to speculate that God discipled Isaac so much so that Isaac also knew about Abraham's God. The God that Abraham worshipped is also the God that Isaac worshipped. And both of them trusted God. Do you think it was only Abraham who was, who was trusting God at this point? Isaac is trusting God as well. Maybe they had this discussion. And Isaac saying, maybe, right? I'm now speculating. Father, I don't know what you're doing. But if it is God's command, let's do it. Because our God would do anything to actually deliver us. Because He is a good God. Yeah? But Abraham lifted up the knife. See, Abraham reached out with his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham has in his mind, as we mentioned a while ago, that as far as he's concerned, Isaac's already dead. And there, he was so ready to actually kill his son, to offer him as a burnt offering, although, although Abraham knew that it was against God's will. He was doing it. But the angel of the Lord called, to, called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I, he said, Do not reach out your hand against the boy, and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your own son, your only son from me. God actually tested Abraham for Abraham's sake. Now Abraham knew that he would obey God and have and trust God till the end. Even even right sacrificing his own son. So God provides Yahweh Yira. Where does that name come from? And how did it become Yahweh Yira? Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. Caught up in the thicket. Question, was the ram there before he was bounding Isaac, or is what it was after? Could the ram have been there all along? We don't know, right? It doesn't matter. The point is, there was a ram suddenly in that place, caught in the thicket. He doesn't need to hunt for it. It was already there. Yeah? And what is it? Instead of Isaac, the ram is actually the substitute for Isaac. So look at this. So there was a ram caught in the thicket by its th th horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place the Lord will provide Yahweh Yira. As it is said to this day, on the mountain, that is Mount Moriah, of the Lord, it will be provided. 
You remember that verse in Hebrews when we read a while ago? You know, about Abraham's faith? The last part of that says, He considered that God is able to raise people. Remember that? Even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So Isaac is actually a type. What does that mean, a type? That Isaac, that picture that we saw, actually is a picture of what is going to happen. Not only is it a picture of what is going to happen, it's happening at the same place that Abraham tried to offer Isaac. On the mountain of the Lord, Mount Moriah, and on the mountain of the Lord, Jerusalem sat. And where Jerusalem sat was where Jesus was sacrificed. Now what's the difference? Abraham loved Isaac. Abraham loved his son. God loved his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Begotten son. The only son that God loved. He offered for you and me. So remember Yahweh Yira. Remember the type. Before you even ask for it, God saw ahead and in advance your greatest problem. He saw in advance, even before the world was created, your greatest need. And it's some place at Moriah, God offered His only Son. The only problem is this. Jesus, who was sacrificed on that mountain, there was no substitute. He was the substitute. And God willingly did that because He loved you and me. And I hope with that we would appreciate how God provides for us. That He does not only provide for your need, He provides for your deepest need, which is Jesus. I pray that every day when you wake up, you would always thank Him for what He's done. And also thank Him for what He's going to do. Because there's more that would happen in this lifetime than you could ever imagine. God is Yahweh Hira, our provider. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for you have shown yourself to us in a very revealing way through your names. Lord, we praise you that you provided Jesus who died in the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray that we would really be a people who would be thankful every day as we wake up. Every day when we come to our knees, we would just see all the wonderful things and amazing things that you do every day. The airy breeze, the nature that we appreciate, the people that surrounds us. Lord, we thank you for them. But we also thank you for the opportunity for us to tell them about you. For it, it's always a privilege and it is an honor for us to tell of the many good things that you have done in our lives. And we pray that we would be masters of sharing the gospel to them. That we would not take it lightly. That we would take your name, exalt your name, by doing what you have told us to do a long time ago. That is to fulfill the Great Commission. For us to go out there, especially in these times, and all the more in these times, for us to be effective people would be discipling people all around the world. Now I would also take this opportunity if you are somebody who have been touched by God today and you've realized that God has provided for you all along 
then you've also realized that you really need a Savior. I would like to take this time for you and give you this opportunity to receive Him as Lord and Savior. And it comes through a prayer. But I would like to warn you that it is not the prayer that would save you, but it is Jesus Himself. And what I would like you to do as I guide you in this prayer is that you talk to Him and pray to Him sincerely asking this. And it goes this way. Father God, I know that I've fallen short. I know that I've done so many things and many shortcomings. And many times I've turned my back against you. Many times I've rebelled against you. But now I realize that you have provided a Savior for us on that mountain. That he died for me on that cross. And because he died, I can be forgiven of my sins. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner that, and that I cannot save myself. But I believe in what Jesus did. And that because he died for me, I now understand that all of my sins are forgiven. Lord, forgive me of my sins. And from this moment onwards, I commit to following you all the rest of my life. Lord, come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Be the master of my life. And let me walk in a way pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.